Hey guys, this is Jonathan Henderson with Pressure Washing Marketing Pros, and I have Aaron Harper with me, the CEO of Rolling Suds. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. So if you guys don't know who Aaron is, he's the CEO of Rolling Suds, and they have, what, what over 180 franchise locations, and it's in the power washing industry, correct? Yep. That's all we do is residential and commercial power washing. That's it. Yeah, man. So I've definitely, I wanted to have Aaron on because I wanted him to dispel some myths, you know what I mean? Educate the industry when it comes to franchising and just overall, just educate people so that they can get different perspectives on this, right? Because sometimes sure. franchising can have a negative connotation, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's why you hear me write a lot about responsible franchising if you follow me on anything. But yeah, no, absolutely. We're trying to change that. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. So Aaron, he... He led two leading franchises when it came to, you know, franchising and them expanding and growing, and they grew hundreds of locations. So I said, what the heck? There's no better guest to have. So yeah, once again, thank you for having, or thank you for being on, Aaron. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks so much. No problem. So the first question I have for you is, how did you get started in franchising? And kind of, can you just tell me your journey into franchising? Because I know you're in the entertainment industry at first, right? Can you just tell me your your beginning sure. journey to this whole thing? Sure. Yeah. So I uh, I grew up in Southern California. I worked in the film and television industry after college. Uh, thought I wanted to be a talent agent um, with like actors and writers. Did that for a few years, rising up um, in that industry. Mm -hmm. was miserable uh hated hated it didn't like uh what i was doing um and uh and then i i i kind of said well what if what else is out there and um went out reached out to some buddies uh that i'd grown up with and one of them said hey you should get into franchise development and i was like what's well, franchise development and they were like he was like well it's you know because i thought much like many other people like franchising is just mcdonald's or chick-fil-a Mm -hmm. And, um, and he told me about like how there's these service businesses that are, they cost less to get in. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can build considerable wealth. And so I loved that idea of being able to help business owners, um, people become business owners, uh, joined a carpet cleaning franchise, uh, started doing franchise development for them, um, helped grow that company. Uh, that company taught me a lot about what not to do. Um, there was a lot of things that I would have loved to change, but I wasn't able to, it was a very long standing company. Um, mm -hmm. that company was then purchased by a private equity backed restoration company that wanted to get into the franchise space. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I worked for the COO of that company and they led a transaction of a drywall repair brand, uh, in COVID. So it was a brand that had a hundred locations, total of 40 franchisees. And it was drywall repair services. So residentials have residential customers have holes in their walls who they need to get it fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I got involved with that company, realized how little support uh, the franchisees had when we first got involved and how much support they needed. Um, and then we built systems uh, around everything they needed in order to uh, provide support uh, the way that I believe a franchisor should. Um, and then the first franchisee that we launched after all the systems were put in place at a full-time skilled labor, hired prior to going to training, we turned leads on for him at training. Mm -hmm. So he, he did like just under $30,000 his first month mm -hmm. and was cash flowing at a 30% margin. Mm -hmm. So I felt we were prepared to grow that company at that point from October of 2020 to October of 2022, I added 223 locations to that business in 24 months. Yeah. And um, what I'm super proud of is all of those locations opened and they opened with jobs on the calendar um, mm -hmm. and and labor hired for training. Mm -hmm. So we became the biggest drywall repair company in the world. We were the 13th fastest growing franchise brand in the world for two years in a row. And um, we had also at that time, well, that's when I started getting involved kind of on a thought leadership level at different franchise conferences. I gave a keynotes, my first keynote speech at the end of last year for the International Franchise Association. The title of my speech was Responsible Franchising, a mm -hmm. Blueprint for Sustainable Growth. And, you know, that's kind of been my uh, my my mantra uh, since I launched Rolling Suds, which I'll get into in a second, but really want to change the standards of franchisors that just don't provide the support necessary to help franchisees be successful. Um and uh, and do it through responsible franchising practices. Um, 
so uh, the, the company came to me that I was working for and they said, we want you to take on a, a brand that we're going to buy and we want you to turn it into a franchise. It's not a franchise yet. We want you to franchise it and we'll double your salary and we'll give you a really fancy title. And I was like, wait a minute, I can do this on my own. I could build a team. I could raise capital. I could find a business that I believe in. I could franchise that business and I can make it become the biggest brand in the world in whichever industry I decide. Mm -hmm. um, so I turned the role down, which was, um, you know, over half a million dollars in guaranteed income. So not, not an insignificant sum of money to turn down. Um, and, uh, and then I went and sought out different businesses. I looked at HVAC and plumbing and solar and tree care and epoxy coatings and line striping and painting and solar, like just a insulation, a bunch of different residential and commercial service businesses. Met the founders of Rolling Suds in September of 2022. It was the best business that I looked at. The founders of Rolling Suds, a lot of guys go to you know the conferences. They know who, who they are. Um, I went to the huge conference last year. Um, mm -hmm. So pretty well known and uh, two plus million dollar power washing business, something special that, that I knew I could replicate. Uh, acquired the franchise rights in January of last year, built a franchise system. We've turned away 58 people who wanted to become franchisees. So it's about $11 million in revenue that we've turned down um, because they just weren't the right people for us. And we've signed up now 51 franchisees who've purchased 187 territories in 26 states. And we've done that since March of last year. Yeah, definitely. You know, we're a marketing company, so I definitely see you guys make your wave and make your blast. So you guys are definitely making an impact. And I'm glad you answered my question because I guess we can go a little bit more specific on it. Um, what made you want, so I know you said Rolling Suds had a good business, but there also had to be more probably in your selection process when you looked at exterior, yeah. like when it came to the exterior cleaning industry, what what kind of resonated with you to be like, hey, this is kind of the industry I want to go ahead and franchise in? Well, first of all, it's a great industry. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know it, I know it, like it's a, it's an amazing industry. Buildings need to be cleaned no matter what you're going to own proper people are going to own property and that property is going to need to be cleaned mm -hmm. at some point at, and at some cadence. So there's a recurring revenue element. There's both residential and commercial. Um, so it's a great industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that I noticed when I looked at the industry th is that it's heavily fragmented. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was actually something I was looking for. So I don't think a professionalized operator is a bad thing for an industry. In fact, I think it can be a phenomenal thing for an industry. So um, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Like back in the like late '90s, early 2000s, mm -hmm. the junk industry was just someone who had a truck and he put junk in the back of it, right? Mm -hmm. And one eight hundred got junk came down from Canada. And they had a professionalized service offering, wrapped vehicles, standardized brand practices, like everything. And they built a billion dollar company in 20 years. And I think it was because part of the reason was they were first. They were the first professionalized service operator mm -hmm. at that time. They didn't have a ton of systems in place from a franchisor perspective. Like it was, you know, Brian Scudamore had a good junk business in Canada, but like didn't know how to franchise. But like now you've got franchisees in that system that were one of the first 20 to 30 franchisees. Mm -hmm. And one of them is doing a hundred million dollars a year in junk. He has 10 markets, thousand employees, and he was a hundred million dollars a year. But that he wouldn't have been able to do that without a franchise. He just wouldn't have, or like he would have had a really hard time doing. It. Mm -hmm. And so I saw an opportunity to basically come in and effectively be the 1-800-GOT-JUNK of power washing, but do it in a way that prioritizes customer experience and more importantly, franchisee experience, because that's what I'm here to do is create good experiences for franchisees. Franchisees are my customers. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that answers your question. No, it definitely answers my question. So Going, it segues to our question to my next question. Very good. So, in your view, what are the primary advantages of like an exterior cleaning business adopting a franchise model over operating independently? Well, so when you have a business, you have to figure everything out. 
Mm -hmm. You have to figure out which marketing companies to use. You have to figure out who's going to answer the phones. You have to figure out what you're going to say when you answer the phones. You have to figure out which insurance company you're going to have. Mm -hmm. Figure out where you're going to get trucks. What kind of trucks are you going to buy? What kind of equipment are you going to buy? What are you going to say to the customers? What's the customer experience after they sign? Uh, Like, you know, agree to the service. What do you pay your technicians? What's your job posting? Like all that stuff you have to figure out as a brand new business owner. Mm Mm-hmm. We figured all that out. Mm -hmm. So when you buy into a franchise, you're using money, which is one form of leverage to get time, which is another form of leverage. So you can either use, so when you, when you buy into a franchise, you pay a franchise fee, you pay an ongoing royalty, but you accelerate the growth to uh, scale faster. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, what I will say is our, we have not, done any kind of like conversions and i'm not opposed to it per se it's just like we it's hard because we have a proprietary truck Mm -hmm. proprietary equipment and if someone has an exterior cleaning business and they want to convert and let's say that business is doing three hundred thousand dollars a year that person now is paying a royalty on the three hundred thousand dollars a year they got to sell all their equipment buy new equipment so it's just a harder transaction. Yes. Um, but the types of people we've brought in, I'm yeah. really excited about. So like we signed up like the largest fast signs franchisee that does $42 million a year. Mm-hmm. I signed up um, someone who raised $20 million and he exited a business for $135 million in a SaaS company. Mm-hmm. I signed up one of the best poker players in the world. We've brought in 11 different C-level executives that were... CFO, CEO, COO, um, and and we're just bringing in really high level operators who are not looking to build a two to three hundred thousand dollar business. They're not even looking to build a million dollar business. Like they're here to build five, ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar businesses. Yeah. And that's what we're that's what we're helping people do. Um, and so I think that that's good for the industry. I just truly do. I think that if we can come in and help um, create some yeah. You know, standardization of practice and professionalized service offerings. And we can do that in every single market in the country. And we bring in a bunch of people who want to build $5 million businesses. I think that's great for the industry. It just shows that there's more market share. No, no, definitely, definitely. Uh, like I, I, I know how hard franchising is and I know about the 1-800-GOT-JUNK kind of thing because I used to be a part owner of a junk removal company, right? Out in oh, Raleigh, did you? Yeah, out in Raleigh, North Carolina. and Nice. Kind of how they operated and how they did things. Definitely, I could see why you know people could go down that path and just I admire that you know I admire the growth that they've had and like I said, you see one eight hundred got junk truck like everywhere you go now. You know what I mean? Yeah. It could be in the suburbs of like Warner Robins, Georgia. You know what I mean? And yeah. One hundred got junk there. Truck. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah, no, definitely. And then I know that I always say that for pressure washing, as you probably know too, it's one of the easiest. I hate to say it that way, but it's one of the easiest kind of businesses, home service businesses to get into, right? So you may not have that standardization. You may not have that productization, right? It's same thing with junk removal, you know, where you can yeah. just be the guy that gets a truck and I can be like, hey, I got a truck. I can pick up some junk and hey, yeah. post when you're in plumbing or pest control, you got get you have to get certain certifications, training, and sure. you know, the time to try to get into that is, is a little bit harder. Can you describe some of the significant challenges you faced when you started the franchise and how you kind of address those? Yeah. So, I mean, whenever, so I raised like a significant amount of capital. So part of the reason why there's such a stigma around franchisors is they typically launch without any capital or with very limited capital. Mm-hmm. And it costs a lot of money to properly franchise a business. Like I have over 22 team members right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that, that, that's because I was able to raise capital and support support franchisees. Mm-hmm. Um, with that, you have your internal staff, and then you have suppliers and vendors, right? That provide services. So, like we have call center that answers the calls. We have a bookkeeping company that does the books. We have an insurance company that gets the insurance. Mm-hmm. Like, and then what happens is there's only so many suppliers. Mm-hmm. that can keep up with scale, right? Mm-hmm. And so we had to fire some suppliers 
uh, because they either weren't providing the level of service that we expe we expected, um, mm -hmm. or they raised their prices for franchisees, um, and uh, and so we would get new suppliers, and that just you know that just happens. Um, you know, I had to learn how to be the CEO of a company uh, where I was working before. I had one direct report underneath me. Um, I knew how the business was supposed to run, but I wasn't in charge of it. So I wasn't when I was working at those companies. So I wasn't able to be, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to be, make the decision. So I've had to learn how to uh, hire, train, recruit, delegate a lot of stuff that I know a lot of business owners struggle with, had to do in a very short amount of time. Um, and I think just in general, you know, we are, our, the majority of our business is commercial. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and my expectation going into this was that the majority would be residential. And that's simply just because of, uh, it took our founders like 27 years to have any kind of like real relevance in the commercial side of the business. But we built infrastructure that does outbound outreach to commercial customers, bringing in either uh, larger commercial jobs or annual contracts. Mm -hmm. And um, we had to build that um, because we saw that there was such a big demand on the commercial side of the business. And the way our trucks are structured, you know, we can we can hit five stories from the ground. Um, we have big, you know, box trucks, 16 foot long. We've got uh, either two to three machines, 10 gallon per minute machines in every truck. We carry a thousand gallons of water. Like it's their big operations that allows us to do these larger jobs much faster. Um, so anyways, there was, there's just in every business you go into, there's growing pains. And um, I think we've done a pretty good job with everything, all things considered. I, I feel very confident that we are in a position now to support a 400 unit network. Um, and that's why I've hired you know a new person every two weeks basically so, yeah so. That, that's a lot so so that's a good segue because i know you said that you guys do a lot of outbound majority of it is commercial so um because we're going to talk about responsible franchising i'm gonna we're also going to talk about what specific qualities you look for in potential franchisees later sure. on in that too but what what would you well, like what unique marketing strategies have you guys you don't have to say all of them i don't you know you guys don't have to say all your secrets but what unique marketing strategy yeah. Have you implemented at Rolling Suds and how have they like driven growth? Because if I'm somebody potentially looking at this, I'm like, look, like, like my biggest fear may be, you know, how, how am I going to get jobs? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Right. So kind of how do you get guys off the ground running whenever you guys first, uh, whenever they first. Sure. So we have six different marketing agencies that we work with mm -hmm. that generate leads for franchisees. Four of them are inbound mm -hmm. residential lead generation companies. Mm -hmm. Two of them are outbound commercial lead generation companies. Mm -hmm. And then we centralize it all in what we call the Rolling Suds Lead Center. So all the leads come to us from the vendors. Vendors bill, bill us, we bill you, we pay the vendors. Um, and we handle, we handle all of that internally. So one of the biggest scary things in starting a business is where am I going to allocate my capital on a from a marketing perspective and which company is going to be able to actually generate leads for me? Mm -hmm. We've removed that variable. Mm -hmm. With the last brand that I worked on, um, we launched 223 locations across the country in two years. Every one of those locations opened and they opened with jobs on the calendar, jobs and estimates. Mm -hmm. And they did that because we turned leads on at training Mm -hmm. We had a similar infrastructure. Now I picked a market, a, a business now with a larger market share, uh, because you have both residential and commercial. So my marketing plan got beefed up, and we developed more relationships. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and then what we do now is basically these outbound commercial marketing companies will out outreach to property managers, facilities managers, maintenance companies, um, really anyone who would need commercial power washing services. And we turn those on a month before going to training and franchisees leave whatever it is they are doing professionally, whether it's, uh, you know, a job or if they've got another business and they can put that person in charge and not someone else in charge of the business for 40 hours a week for four weeks before they've even gone to training, mm -hmm. they're out doing business development in their market, um, responding to leads that we generate for them um, and going out and selling jobs. And so people are coming to training. Some of our people are coming to training with thousands of dollars on the calendar already. Yeah. So that's it. So. Yeah. And that, and that leads me to my next question is, 
like what does a training regimen for new Rolling Suds franchisees involve? Like how does it prepare them for success? Because that was perfect how you kind of said like, hey, they already have a thousand on the books when they're doing their training. So how does that training look when they first get on? Yeah. So we have what we call our um, eight week power launch program. Mm -hmm. um, and so then you have one week in person. So during those eight weeks, we teach franchisees everything they need to know about about running the business, how to read a PL, how to do marketing, how to generate referral partnerships, how to um, like how to run the business, how to operationalize the truck, how to like everything. We do it all virtually. Four weeks into their power launch program, we put them out on the road. We don't, they don't have their truck yet, but they have a wrapped personal vehicle that's that's wrapped and they're out doing business development. Um, we, during that time are doing a ton of like logistics stuff. We're building their truck for them. We're getting their vehicle wrapped. Like we're helping them find a physical location that, you know, warehouse space. Like there's a ton of stuff we're doing there. Um, the only thing we can't teach franchisees virtually is how to run the truck, how to, how to, how to operate it, make it go fast, how to do our proprietary process. Mm -hmm. so we spend a week long in person. So we have, we have our April training happening right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have eight different groups out from different parts of the country that are in training right now. And, um, and so their, their technicians fly out on Tuesday night um, uh, every time for training. The first couple of days of training, we teach our franchisees our process. Mm -hmm. um, and then we oversee our franchisees teaching their employees the process the next few days. So it is a train the trainer model, which allows them to lead from the front. And so they leave training with two full-time guys working for them, a general manager in training, and then a junior technician. They've done business development for a full month prior to going to training. So they have jobs and estimates on the calendar and they know how to focus on growing the business and spending all day long being the business owner versus the the floor washer um and uh, while there's nothing wrong with with getting your hands dirty and being power washer our franchisees are more focused on what do i need to do to to grow um and spend my time in in full-blown growth mode of course because as as you probably see right now what's plaguing the exterior cleaning industry is a lot of guys are just owner operators right they're on the trucks they're getting their hands dirty but they don't necessarily spend that time to grow their business or to work on their business in terms of like the systems the processes and just these little nuances that you have in business so how did you guys at rolling suds like develop your your sops or your standard or standardize your like operational systems uh to yeah. ensure efficiency and quality how did you guys go about doing that so the cool thing is, and part of the reason why I partnered with the founders of Rolling Suds is they had done that for 34 years. Okay. Like they started the business in 1990. Mm -hmm. Like they figured out all the power washing, you know, kinks. They figured it all out. Mm -hmm. And so I brought the knowledge of how to properly franchise a business. Mm -hmm. They brought the knowledge of power washing. Mm -hmm. um, and we we partnered. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, founder's uh, son, um, so Brian Wendling uh, Jr., he took over his dad's business in uh, excuse me, 2015 mm -hmm. after he graduated from college. And um, the business was doing like eight or 900 grand at that time in top line revenue. And uh, when I came on at the end of 2022, we had done over 2.2 million. So he took it you know, to that size and essentially prepared it for franchising, put all the SOPs in place, developed an operations manual, figured out, all right, we've got something special here. Mm -hmm. Let's see, instead of, you know, maybe adding more locations, let's see about franchising. Um, but they realized that franchising is a completely different business than power washing. And I'm so glad that they did. Um, because uh, a lot of franchisors are like, I got a good painting business. Here we go. I'm going to franchise it. Other people are going to buy it. It's going to be yeah. great. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, is that franchising is a different, completely different business. It's a year. It's going to require more capital. It requires different infrastructure, different org structures, different skill sets. I mean, like there's so much that goes into doing franchising and doing it the right way 
And so they realized, listen, this is my family name that we've built this thing together as a family business for 33 years. Mm-hmm. Not at the time when I, it was 33, now it's 34. We don't want to sign people up and not give them the support that they need. And mm-hmm. if we allocate all our time to this new franchise thing, it's going to take away from our $2.2 million power washing business that we love and know how to run really well. So what if we met like a franchisor uh, and the franchisor did did all the franchising part and we just kept running our power washing business and helped the franchisor build, you know, build the franchise system. And so um, they were looking for someone like me. I was looking for someone like them. It was a perfect, perfect match. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah. That's how that's how things got started. No, of course. And so as we know, when you first start a business, profitability is one of the main factors, right? One of the key factors. And I know you guys, just like you previously just discussed, you guys have really honed in on that process, put thousands of jo- dollars on the books and all of that for people sure. before they even started. Uh, but what financial strategies do you recommend or like just kind of, you know, tactics or anything like that? Do you recommend new franchisees to help them achieve like just more efficient profitability quickly when they're first starting, because there may, I know there may be some hiccups all the time. Right. But I know you guys give ongoing support. Cause my next question to you would be, you know, what does the ongoing support look like for you guys sure. as these as well? Yeah. So what I should preface this with saying is yes, profitability is very important and we definitely want our franchisees to get profitable. Mm-hmm. The types of operators that we've brought in have three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in cash Mm -hmm. to get the business started yeah so it's more important for our operators to get revenue Mm -hmm. uh, uh, than like we're going to get profitable immediately and start taking money out of the business right like it's all about how much can we put into the business to get it to a size that's worthwhile enough to make the investment does that make sense that makes perfect sense actually yes so like they're coming to the table with 300 grand. They're not giving us three, 300 grand. Like they're buying at least two territories. They're going to have a down payment ready to go for the second truck. They're going to launch that second truck within six months. Like it's like a whole, bl- it's like, a, and some of them are buying like four territories, which means they got to get up to four trucks in a period of time. Like it is, it, it's, that's it's like a speed, like we're we're scaling this thing and we're doing it. Like I joke, we're we're moving fast and we're breaking things. And that's what we're that's kind of the mentality of our of our franchisees is move fast and break things. Perfection um, is a profit. That's 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 kind of what I tell my my team. Like, hey guys, look, perfection is the enemy of profit. We just gotta do things and we'll yeah. perfect it as we go on. Yeah. Right. My thought is is once we get up to a certain revenue number, let, let's worry about margins. But mm-hmm. there's only so much you can impact margins without revenue. Mm-hmm. So it's it you see what I'm saying? So it's like less about yeah. like if you're only doing eighty do thousand, why do you really care? Like eighty thousand, like if you're on charge to do eighty thousand in a year, why do you care about how profitable you are on eighty thousand? Like you'd rather care about how profitable you are on like five hundred thousand dollars. So you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I mean, our franchisees are trying to do eighty thousand dollars a month, right? So like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, right? Yeah, like within the first 18 months, like, so like, right. that's the goal. And that's what people are working to do. So like, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a different mindset. So we teach, a, we teach franchisees how to read a PL. We have a bookkeeping company that does their books. Mm-hmm. We set up their chart of accounts. We have a credit card processing company that's linked with the CRM that we give them. Like all that stuff is built into it, but we try to have our franchisees think from the perspective of, let's get as much revenue on the books and let's make, let's make revenue the most important thing. And I, I joke, but it's true. Like when you are starting a business, you are chief revenue officer. Like that is your job. Your job is bringing in as much revenue as possible. And to your point about, you know, a lot of owner operators, again, nothing wrong with that. I have nothing against them. I think that's a great way to make a living. It's hard to focus on revenue all day long if you're doing the cleaning, which is where we don't have any franchisees come in um, who expect to do any, do the cleaning. Mm-hmm. So no, that's awesome. So you guys already have the hiring program, all of that. So um, my next question for you is, cause you've already talked about how you guys kind of have ongoing support for Rolling Sud. So like you guys, sure. you know, 
you guys like have. So I know you're saying that you have this April training that you guys are doing right now, but can can you detail a little bit more about the ongoing support? Yeah. Yeah, these franchises. Yeah, so we do we do a nine week launch project process, which is called our power launch program. The, the final week is in person, and then franchisees graduate. So I'll be at graduation dinner tomorrow night with eight different groups across the country. We did, we launched ten groups across the country last last month, um, and then prior to that we launched eight, and then the month prior we launched three. So after you leave, a lot of franchisors will be like, "Go, oh, good luck! Like we're never going to call you again, and like pay us your royalty every single month," which I think is awful because um, my thought process is that franchisees pay us a royalty, and in return for the royalty, we provide services. A franchisor is a service company, just like a power washing company is a service company that you service your customers that own buildings that need to be cleaned. We're a service company providing a business in a box, you know, type situation to our franchisees. And in return for those services, we're paid a royalty. So ongoing as the business grows, franchisees need different services. Mm -hmm. um, might need different, like the dip, the, the services that a franchisee needs at two trucks is a different level of support than a franchisee that has eight trucks. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're focused on um, kind of providing that ongoing support, but doing it in a proactive way. So I'll give you an example. Um, we, the general like kind of rule of thumb in franchising is somewhere between 20 and 30 franchisees uh, to one business coach. We have 28 operating franchisees and we have four business coaches, mm -hmm. including a senior vice president of operations. So, you know, we're we're just we're way ahead of the curve um, because we want to provide this like incredible ongoing support. And the business coaches that I've hired, one of them had two Dunkin Donuts that he grew to 26 locations. Another one was a multi-unit and he exited. Another one was a multi-unit um, franchisee who had a, a, a brick and mortar Lego franchise. He had multiple locations. He exited. Another one helped build a pressure washing business to a pretty large size. Um, working for the founders helped build them their their business. Um, he's a, so like you, I'm bringing on people that provide this ongoing extensive support because honestly, like business ownership is lonely. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have people to talk to about your problems like and so with a franchise you have business coaches that you're meeting with weekly forever and you also have a community of franchisees that are all doing the same thing in different markets that can help each other out and so we we try to you know continue to earn our royalty and and what what, what you're paying us on an ongoing basis so Mm -hmm. So you guys have built a community and then you guys are kind of adapting to the times to everybody's specific needs. And so that's, that's actually really good because, you know, that can have exponential kind of impact on people because, you know, it's building that community, it's building the knowledge. And even like I said, the loyalty, all of that. So no, I definitely like that. So let's, let's talk about responsible franchising and what qualities you look for in potential franchisees. So what makes a good what makes a good, you know, franchisee like, 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 what do you look for when you're looking for somebody that's like, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I'm looking to go ahead and invest in a rolling suds. I want to go ahead and start this power washing company. Like, what do you look for in somebody uh, as a franchisee? Number one thing we're looking for is grit, mm -hmm. unwillingness to give up, mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, the people that we've brought in, I've been fortunate, like they would be successful in any business, whether it was a franchise or not, or they've already been successful um, uh, or they ran other people's businesses or they were running, running a business unit in someone else's. You see what I'm saying? Like they're, they're just higher level operators. Mm -hmm. um, the people that I've turned down, mm -hmm. which will probably help answer your question a little bit better. Um, I didn't feel like we're going to be able to buy a, a, and build a business. I thought that they were going to be able to buy a job or maybe only get to like one to two trucks, which is again, nothing wrong with that. It's just not our buyer. It's just not our franchisee. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I, I like to talk about, our franchisees are, are goalpost movers. A million dollar business isn't interesting to them. If they got to $3 million, they'd say, how do I get to eight? Who do I have to acquire to get to 12? Who do I have to acquire in a different market to get to 18? 
like those are the types of people that are coming in as Rolling Suds franchisees. And um, and we provide the support in order to help them achieve their goals by giving them business coaching, marketing strategies, like referral partnerships, and then eventually national accounts, which is our plan next year is to go out and get national accounts because we'll have uh, over 100 trucks on the road by the end of this year. So there's a ton of things that um, we're looking for, but but really kind of like empire builders who align with our culture and our values. Um, our mission statement is this is a relationship. I believe that, you know, as long as we focus on building meaningful relationships with those that we interact with, everything else will fall into place. Um, you know, I think where people in business get in a sticky situation is they only want to build relationships with those that are going to result in higher transactions or whatever. And I just look at every single interaction like, hey, you never know what's going to happen. And realistically, it just makes me, I feel like a good person, um, want to be a good person by, by um, you know, building a relationship with those persons, with those people. Um, and then our, our four core values are uh, communication, compassion, being honest and helpful. Um, it's worked really well for me to say, how can I help um, versus like, you know, so that's, that, that's what we're looking for. People who want to build big businesses and have the capacity, the grit, the willingness, the capital and the wherewithal to do it. No, that is, that's totally understandable. So can you tell, can you elaborate more on, um, responsible franchising because I know you had a keynote, you know, you had a keynote speech about that, and so I know that I also see, like I said, you're always posting on social media, man. You know, I I love it, right? Always out there promoting and educating, and so I love to see it. So, can you tell us about responsible franchising? Yeah, sure. So, franchising costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend anyone franchise for have unless they've got at least half a million to a million plus allocated completely to go towards franchising. Mm -hmm. Very few people have that amount of money, which is why you have a lot of franchisors that fail is because they get into franchising, think that they could franchise, realize they know nothing about franchising, burn the $200,000 that they have saved to go towards franchising and they're out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and my part of my personal mission is to stop or at least decrease that, that churn um, every single year. 300 franchisors decide to file their franchise agreement every year or like a franchise disclosure document is what it's called mm -hmm. every year 300 franchisors file their last ever franchise agreement franchise disclosure document so that means 300 open 300 close every year so it's a hundred percent like and and i think a lot of it has to do with a lack of education Mm -hmm. because if you typed in online, I want to franchise my business. And the person who got online in front of you said, I think that's probably a terrible idea. Let me tell you why. And you're going to need a million dollars. You'd be like, I'm not doing that. Like, or I'm going to need half a million. I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, and it's going to take away from everything, you know? So anyways, that's like the problem as I see it. There's a bunch of other stuff. There's a lot of unethical acts and a lot of, you know, bad apples and a lot of bad behavior. But I think that it starts with just a lack of education. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to build franchise brands the right way and then write content every day about how we're doing it and why mm -hmm. so that it can help other people who say, oh, I want to franchise my business, fully understand what they're getting themselves into. So I proposed at the end of last year, four core tenants of responsible franchising. The mm -hmm. first is setting clear expectations. So setting clear expectations with both franchisees and franchisors of what they can expect. Mm -hmm. um, if you tell a franchisee, it's going to be very hard. You might fail. You're going to work sleepless nights. You may not be able to make payroll sometimes, but here are the upsides and here's the support we provide to help you get through it and that franchisee still says, I want to be a franchisee, we're going to have a way better chance of like having a good relationship long-term than if I was like, it's easy. It's so fine. Like you just kind of sit home and like collect, you know, your, your bank account gets bigger every month and you don't have to really work hard. Like then, then you have mismatch expectations. So that's the first one. Choosing the right uh, franchisees. So only allowing the franchisees in that are going to mesh with your culture that you're building 
um, and also are the right person. A lot of franchisors get into the situation where they got to make payroll. They're going to take a check from this guy, even though they know he's going to be a bad franchisee because mm -hmm. they got to make payroll. Um, so we've been very diligent on who we've let in. We've turned away more than one person per week, which like I told you earlier is about $11 million that I've turned out. It's the best money I'll never make. Um, and, uh, so that's the, so, um, so choosing the right franchisees is the second tenant, mm -hmm. um, capital adequacy. So making sure that franchisees and franchisors have the right amount of money in order to be successful, um, a lot of franchisees will take out like a SBA loan. They've got $50,000 to their name. Maybe they're worth a quarter million dollars in net worth. And they decide to go take out an SBA loan and buy, buy a franchise for half a million dollars. I think that is completely irresponsible. Um, I personally don't think anyone should invest more than 30%, 35, 30 to 35-ish percent of their net worth into a business. But that's just me personally. Um, if you have the assets that you can pull from, whether it's home equity or 401k or stocks or cash or bonds or whatever combination of all of it, you're going to be in a better position to build a big business than if you're borrowing from everywhere. You know, there's there's a lot of reasons that businesses fail. Um, having too much money is not one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> there's never enough right for a lot of people there, yeah having having too much money to, to allocate towards growing a business is not one of the reasons that people fail um and then the final tenant is sustainable growth mm -hmm. so only selling the number of units that you can actually open and then open to profitability right so it each franchisor needs to know how much money is it going to cost me in infrastructure to get one unit open and profitable and then have that number and then say, all right, how much money do I need to sell the amount of units that I want to sell? So if it's $80,000 and they want to sell 15 units, they need 15 times $80,000 before they decide to franchise. Um, you know, and, and only the franchisor knows that number. So those are the four um, kind of tenants that I've proposed. Um, the industry at large and franchising is talking about other ways to define responsible franchising because I'm not the only one and I don't want to be, mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. And I have an article actually coming out um, in Entrepreneur Magazine um, that I was asked to write uh, with a professional writer um, on responsible franchising. That's 3,000 words and it comes out in the next issue in uh, a week and a half. So um, I'll share it with you. If you want to share it with your viewers, you're more than welcome to. Of course, man. Of course I want to. You know what I mean? So I have that. So I got about two or three more questions left for you, man. You know what I mean? So sure. I'm off right now. So what differentiates Rolling Suds from other competitors in the market? Yeah. So we have a proprietary cleaning process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, a lot of people, if they know Brian Wendling Sr. in the power washing space, you know, people on the PWMA, P PWNA, mm -hmm. they jokingly refer to him as the guy who washes wrong, which mm -hmm. is hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, so that goes into the equipment that we buy, which manufacture, there's only, you know, so many manufacturers that we have a lock on the manufacturer for the equipment. And then we build it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So internally. So like you saying, hey, I want to go open a power washing business. Um, I want to buy the truck that Rolling Suds has. You can't do it. We make it ourselves. It's our equipment. We retrofit it ourselves. And it allows us to do jobs considerably faster. So before I got into the power washing industry, I was a failed. Uh, I tried to do power washing for like a Sunday afternoon. And um, we bought one of those like three hundred dollar machines and burned a Sunday, like burned it. Like I'll never get that Sunday back. And then six months later, it needed to be cleaned again because I didn't use SH, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and and you know, I was one of the you know people who I was I was the perfect Rolling Suds customer. Yeah. And that took me four hours, five hours maybe to do my twenty six hundred square foot house. We do a 3,000 square foot house in between 20 to 25 minutes, start to finish, set up, bear down, everything. 
with our process. And, you know, that's a four to $500 job in 20 to 25 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can shoot five stories from the ground. We can hit five stories up SH, you know, from the ground, the way we do it, um, which allows us to move faster on commercial jobs. So there's a whole differentiating element that we have that's unique. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you. Is there any inspiring success stories you can share from within your franchise network that like just any, like just any yeah. kind of inspiring sure. story? Yeah. So we launched seven franchisees, 22 territories um, last year. Um, we didn't let more than three people into a training class because we were still getting our bearings. Mm -hmm. Out of the seven of them, uh, five of them added their second truck within the first six months of operation. Oh, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that and that usually takes guys like a, like two to three years to go ahead and do. You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, no, that's that's awesome. So looking back, what is like one key lesson from the franchising journey or just entrepreneurial journey that uh, that you wish you had known earlier? Um, for those who are considering business ownership, stop considering it and just do it. And for those who are considering going full time or doing it part time stop considering it and just go full time. Um there there's like you you can only you're you can only give 100% of your attention to like one thing, right? And like you don't want to like be like all right, I'm going to do like real estate investing and like pressure washing, I'm going to do like my fire fireman business or I'm going to work as a fireman and I'm like going to do all these things. It's like just pick one lane and put everything you've got towards it. Every person who I know who's generated like considerable wealth did at least 18 to 36 months of just like heads down grinding mm -hmm. um, to grow something really big and then go focus on diversification of where you need to put capital. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, you know, I will say like in my years in franchising, I spent, uh, I spent years talking to people and helping them become business owners and um, years. And, uh, and I just was like, wait a minute, you know, I'm going to be doing this. If I just keep doing this, I'm going to help keep helping people become business owners, but I'm going to be an employee mm -hmm. until I decide to take my own advice. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to find a business to franchise. I don't know what business is it, it is yet. I'm going to raise capital. I don't know where I'm going to get it, but I'm going to do it. And like, you just set your mind to it and you just do it. And like, you understand that it's not going to be perfect and you just go. And that's probably the best advice that I can give anyone um, who either wants to go full time in a business or um, wants to get into entrepreneurship. Okay. Okay, so that no, that's definitely was some good advice. And so my last question for you, um, and I, and and it might be kind of just like the same question you just answered, but just do you have anything that makes you like a better entrepreneur that you could share with others? You know what I mean? Like just just like as yourself, I always ask this question as like my last question, just like a hack or anything like that. I don't sure. Know, just in mindset, whatever it may be, that makes you a better entrepreneur. Yeah, I I think just understanding like what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. And then realizing that like everything else that I'm not that good at needs to be, or I'm not as good at needs to be hired for. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm in the process of building a C-suite, which most people wait until like a certain size business to get a C-suite. And my thought is, is like, I'd rather build that now so that like, you know, I've got, I've got that in place when we have 500 locations, because by the end of, by this time next year, we'll have over 300 locations by this time next year. <laughs> and um, so what do I need to do now to, to build for that? And, um, and, and business is, it's just, just a game. It's, it's like, it's like, all right, well, what puzzle pieces need to be put together later down the line in order to make like this puzzle work now. Mm -hmm. And, you have to be working on the business and seeing what needs to be done in order to uh, make it, make an impact uh, and do and grow it in the way that where you can truly have 
wealth and uh, potentially a business that runs without you. So, um, but if you're in it day to day doing the stuff, doing the stuff in the business doesn't run without you, you don't really have a business. You have a, maybe a really high paying job, uh, you know, and that's, again, that's okay. Um, but it's just not what I'm here to do. No, well, understandable. Well, like I said, Aaron, thank you so much for your time. I, I think that was a lot of good, fresh uh, information for anybody that is watching this. As you know, majority of our viewers and listeners are going to be in the exterior cleaning industry or people that are interested in getting the exterior cleaning industry. So I think that you answer a lot of these questions fantastically. And I really appreciate you for joining on. And I wish you guys the best of luck. Cause like, if you guys get in the 300, you know, by next year, that means that you're probably going to add like uh, over a hundred more than correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, you know, I, I look forward to just seeing your journey throughout this entire time, uh, you know, on social media, just all of this. And so guys, if you want to go ahead and reach Aaron, like where, where can people reach you at? So I put out a lot of content on Twitter. Um, I'm, I put out content on all of the channels, um, both the video and written. Um, uh, so my Twitter is Aaron Harper, CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, Instagram is Aaron T. Harper, T as in Timothy. Um, and then you can find me on LinkedIn. I put out a ton of content there as well. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're interested in learning how to become a Rolling Suds franchisee and you feel like you'd be a good fit, you can just go to rollingsudsfranchise.com and submit uh, you know, to to get more information and someone from my team will reach out. Sounds good. I'll, I'll talk to Alyssa to get all those links below. You know what I mean? For everybody. So yeah, and guys, that's, that's where you can find Aaron. Um, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. And we'll see you guys in the next video or podcast if you guys are listening there. So thank you guys so much. And thank you for your time, Aaron. Thank you for having me.